Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to my channel, Pediatric Classes. Today, we are going to discuss about another IEP STG guidelines. So, let me start sharing my screen. That uh, the guidelines is on a very important topic that is our uh, post COVID uh, in children. Okay. So, about this. What I want to tell you is these guidelines of IAP are really, really useful. I started being one of it, actually, hypothyroidism guidelines. We have done it uh, two weeks back. So this is the next guideline. So many things are coming every week. I think two or three guidelines are coming. Uh, please requesting all the uh, pediatricians to go through the guidelines. They are very crisp and clear. So this topic on post-COVID lung disease in children. Before the start, let me request you all to please subscribe to my channel if you have not done so yet. And uh, with the great amount of thanks to the team behind this guidelines. That is our lead author, Kabra sir, and the co-authors, Kana Ramjat and Dr. Praveen Kumar sir, both, all of them. Actually, they have done a great job. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you. And also a uh, big amount of thanks to Dr. Ramesh Kumar, Sir, our IEP president, or Dr. Pinto, sir, Dr. Pishwita, sir, Dr. Vinin Saxena, sir, all of them, the team has come out with a very good uh, guidelines on the post COVID lung disease in children. So uh, about the SARS-CoV infection, as you all know, it is primarily very mild in children and it generally results in four weeks. This recommendation, please understand, they are based on the available current evidence. The authors have actually gone through the many uh, studies and although the meta-analysis and come out with these guidelines, these are subject to change as and when the new evidence are coming up. So about the post-COVID lung disease in children, some patients may experience persistent symptoms attributed to COVID infection beyond 12 weeks, and this cannot be explained by any other alternate diagnosis. So they are known by different names like post-COVID-19 symptom or long COVID, long haul COVID-19, chronic COVID-19, post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, uh, etc. So the highlighting point here is about the 12 weeks cut off. So, so 12 weeks are really, really important. So please note that. Uh, so this is the point we should know. Just don't label it by seeing a uh, four week old child uh, for post COVID four week around, it's around 12 weeks. Now, the prevalence of post-COVID-19 infection in adults is variable and they range from 5 to 80 percentage. About the prevalence in children, uh, long COVID, uh, it is not available or limited in four is available. So what are the clinical features and what are their prevalences? Based on a meta-analysis, including 17 studies in children and young people with COVID, it was reported that one of the symptoms is persistent cough, which is seen in around 17 percent of children, or dyspnea in 43 percentage. Another review of 14 studies uh, have actually shown that there are persistent symptoms of running nose or congested nose of 1 to 12 percentage, chest pain or chest tightness in 1 to 13 percent, 31 percentage, and sleep disturbances in 2 to 63 percentage. And other clinical manifestations include fever, fatigue, headache, cognitive dysfunction, myalgia, pain abdomen, diarrhea, loss of smell, etc. So, however, a comparison of prevalence of symptoms in COVID infected and non-infected population showed no difference, suggesting that some of the long COVID symptoms may be an indirect effect of the pandemic. That is really important because many a times because of the lockdown, maybe because of the, the school closure, actually people are having so many problems, which may be attributed to a long COVID thing also. So coming to the fear pathophysiology, this is not precisely known. It is found that maybe due to the direct damage to the respiratory system or any other systems which are involved, maybe cardiac, metrological or nutritional, etc. The posterior mechanisms are lung damage due to initial infections or due to ongoing virus host interactions, or maybe the inflammation is actually persisting in the body and this actually is going on and causing a long COVID syndrome, or maybe the body is making less antibody response or and that either a very exaggerated immune response also can be a problem. This can lead on to autoimmunity and this can lead on to long COVID syndromes. So what are the risk factors? Uh, risk factors now, as of now known are the increasing age of six to 18 years, female gender, was pre-infection health. That means the children who are actually having some chronic disorders before the uh, infection of COVID, presence of allergic diseases, severe infections, and prolonged hospitalization. These are the risk factors which are known to actually uh, cause a long COVID in children. 
what are types of CVRT? They actually can present with reactive airway disease or an interstitial, like an interstitial lung disease or a post-infective bronchiolitis obliterans or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, exercise intolerance, etc. So that no laboratory tests can distinguish this from any etiology. So, so all these things should adopt a conservative approach with minimum investigations and focus on the optimizing health conditions. Why we told us, see, as you can see from the previous uh, slide, that the manifestations of the can be varied from uh, different types they can present with to you. So we have to actually have a eye on the assessment. This is a very good table given. Uh, so I, I can tell you this one. So first is the clinical history examination. We will ask for history of, the look for dyspnea, ask to cough, chest pain, exercise intolerance, fatigue, sore throat, nasal congestion, voice change, etc. Chest imaging is warranted only if there is a persistent symptoms without clinical improvement or with the development of new symptoms. Pulmonary function tests with a bronchodilator reversibility may be considered in children more than five years because that will actually help us know what is the pattern of the lung involvement. Either it is obstructive or it is restrictive, etc. And a positive BDI test will indicate that it is a reactive airway disease. And exercise test, about a six-minute walk test and a cardiopulmonary exercise testing, because in one of the studies it showed that the six-minute tests were observed in 66.6% of children with the long COVID. Other conditions like heart disease and thrombopathic disease should be ruled out before actually we attempt to do a CPT. About plethysmography and diffusing uh, carbon monoxide studies and all those things, this can help in actually diagnosing a restricted disease as shown by a nerve trapping. So residual volume by TLC will be more than 30%. So please understand according to the symptoms, we have to have, have a conservative approach. And then we need, because this is very difficult to identify a post-COVID lung disease from other etiologists. So we have to be very conservative, but we have to have the required investigations too. Coming to the treatment, there is no study on the post-COVID lung disease treatment in children. The treatment is mainly symptomatic and supportive because it depends on how is a disease pattern. For example, if the lung is having an obstructive airway pattern like this, you can actually go for a bronchodilators with or without inhale steroids. But if the child is having a documented interstitial lung disease type of pathology, this is actually similar to non-COVID ILD. So the treatment is also similar, including systemic steroids and or, or other immunosuppressants or immunomodulated drugs with monitoring. What about the prevention? Again, prevention, um, so actually, the information on it is really scarce. Some of the risk factors mentioned are actually, most of it are non-modifiable, except maybe the pre-infection health. Therefore, children with any existing disease should be managed appropriately and aggressively to keep the disease under control. We also learned that the longer the hospital stay, the more chance of actually the child going into long COVID syndrome. So that also is really important. So we have to manage the children uh, properly and aggressively. Prognosis, lack of studies and long-term follow-up of children with COVID. Uh, so there's only one study from Norway that shows that increase in the healthcare usage in the children age group, six months to five years for respiratory and other general conditions. What about the role of vaccination? Information again on this on the impact of vaccination, the post-COVID sequelae is actually lacking. A preprint study in adults reported that vaccination was associated with decreased acute COVID complications and long-term sequelae. It was more evident in adults less than 60 years of age rather than more than 60 years of age. This was a very uh, good point which we found from this, uh, which we learned from this because we uh, will expect the other way around. But then it has been found that the vaccination actually prevents the lung damage in adults less than 60 years than adults more than 60 years. And what about the follow? As you all know, it is a newly emerging illness. Long-term sequelae risk evaluation, including pathophysiology, effect on the health, lung health, all those things we need to learn. Multiple centers should develop cohort of children with COVID-19 infection of different severity and prepare uniform meticulous follow-up plans so that the data can be combined later on to obtain meaningful results. So lung involvement in risk also can have a lung involvement. Basically, in a newly defined, that is, we have dealt extensively with the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children in many of the above videos. And then this is a newly defined disease that develops actually two to four weeks after COVID-19 
mean, as you all know. So when how does it affect the lens? Actually, it can have uh, different types of lesion. There may be non-specific, it may be non-consolidation, it may be cavitary lesions, it may be pleural effusion, ground glass opacities or imaging, etc. So this is a flow chart which is actually given in the IAP uh, guidelines. This is a proposed flow diagram for children uh, with suspected post-COVID lung disease. Suppose a child is coming to you with suspected post-COVID, immediately take a detailed history and examination and look for pre-existing diseases, current signs and symptoms with duration, treatment history, whether where to hospitalize, how long was the duration of hospitalization, whether respiratory support was given, or if so, what was it, what are the medications given, etc. And you need to review the previous investigations, including the imaging. And if the duration is around 4 to 12 weeks, that means it is mild to moderate severity, continue supportive therapy and rehabilitation. And if the symptoms persist or we are feeling that the symptoms are worsening to severe thing or the duration is more than 12 weeks and or severe, we need to find out what is the clinical patterns involved. Find or look for other system involvement and pulmonary function test and six minute walk test also should be done for those children. Again, seeing an obstructive pattern as I have with a bronchial reversibility, dilated reversibility test, the treatment differs, or is it a restrictive lung disease? C is then CCT to be done if not done earlier or repeat if required. Plethysmography and or deficient study is also preferable to be done. Impaired six-minute walk test is due to go in a cold cardiography too. And all this is there are three different types of involvement. Cardiopulmonary clinical exercise test, if available, should also be done. So about the management, it's all supportive. Optimal anesthesia symptoms, continue the uh, supportive treatment and rehabilitation. Optimal treatment of the underlying disease should be done and follow the national guidelines for vaccination in children. So in, to conclude, as you have, we have discussed here about the post-COVID lung disease in children uh, with the risk factor. What I've liked the best about these guidelines is they have actually told specifically the risk factors actually that will help us. And also what are the symptoms? It's not just a cough or a distance. There are so many other symptoms involved, especially the persistent running nose and also there are so many other symptoms involved. And they have actually given a very beautiful flow diagram on the uh, how to approach a child who is actually presenting to you. And the, please understand, don't forget get this 12 weeks cut off but the 12 weeks is really important covid 19 may uh, actually cause a post covid syndrome including the post covid lung disease which we have actually discussed in detail now there's no information of treatment on treatment and preventive measures as i have discussed it's all depending on how is the lung involvement whether it is a obstructive lung involvement or is it a restricted lung involvement another thing is it's expected that with new information we'll better understand the pathophysiology clinical manifestation treatment and preventive aspects of long covid in children. Please understand these guidelines are subject to change as and when the new uh, information on this emerging uh, disease and the emerging low for, for long COVID syndromes are uh, to come. So all these things are uh, to be understood. Uh, please uh, pay attention to all this uh, IAP SDG guidelines. It is a sincere request from my side. So uh, they're really wonderful things because of the lack of time. I'm not able to make all the videos. Uh, if Time purpose, I would be happy to do that because that's a way we actually, uh, you know, we get a very crisp and clear idea of all those topics. And thank you so much. And uh, these are the references which are given in the guidelines. So hope you have liked this session. If so, please do comment, like it, and share with your friends. Thank you so much and stay safe.